Hi, I'm Yoko Shioya again. Now is the time for Q&A. Um, let me bring Aya Ogawa with me here. Aya, are you ready? Oh, you're here. Hi. <laughs> Hi, how are you? I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us for this Q&A. It's great to have you here again. Thanks for having me. Um, yep. So um, the anyway, I think that the many people are um, having a lots of questions and then, you know, don't be shy, everybody, that you can put uh, your question on your chat. Then um, I will start with this session uh, with my own question to Aya. So, um, you know, I saw your piece from work in progress to the final one in the theater version for the theater version. The, uh, the last one final version was 2015. And now uh, that was four years later than the disaster. And now 10 years later, and then we are in totally different world in under the pandemic. I just would like to know how your um, intention to deliver your whatever you want to deliver to the audience or express yourself or how the communication with the team is different from those days. You know, that's just, uh, um, I'm so curious because we can share so, like, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, uncertainty and, um, um, you know, the natural or the man-made, I don't know which one, the, you know, disaster. So just, Give me about this um, thing. It's kind of vague question, but I'm curious. Yeah, so um, during this pandemic year, um, I actually had been thinking a lot about this section of Ludic Proxy. Um, I mean, the first and most superficial reason I was thinking about it was because the game mechanics of this play with the audience participating in choosing what one of the actors does um, is embedded in the script. So if you look at the script, it looks like a choose your own adventure book, like jump to page 62 or you know whatever. So I felt that for that reason, it would be a really good, uh, and meaningful translation onto a digital platform. Um, and so we were talking about, you know, doing this near the end of the summer, um, which if you remember, the end of the summer was also a very different time than now, you know, things felt a little bit easier and people were outside and things felt more manageable. Um, and so, you know, originally we were hoping to be in person actually to shoot in person. Um, but then as we approached the shoot date, which was in December with the holidays and everything and the, and the infection rates were rising again, we had to really uh, quickly shift and pivot to do a remote shoot. Um, I mean, all that to say that our, approach to the play and our approach to each other as a creative team was constantly shifting. And, and my <laughs> main thing was just to make sure our communication was clear with everybody and that we were taking care of ourselves. And, you know, making this piece again for this platform was in in my way um, taking a care of the artists in my community and my collaborators who mean the most to me. Um, some of the people on my creative team are people I've been working with for uh, 10 years, 15 years. So we have, um, we're starting off with a deep level of trust in each other and it really required that trust to be able to pull the piece together. Mm. Mm. That's interesting. Well, so by now there are so many questions. So let me pick up some. The first question, 
Um, can you talk about the actor's Zoom set? The production value was very high and really added to the um, psychology of the characters. How long did you spend filming? Right, so as I was saying, originally we were, we had planned a two week shoot at the Japan Society um, in mid-December. And it was right, I think it was just like literally the week of Thanksgiving when we decided that we couldn't risk being in person. Um, and uh, we were like, well, we've, we've got to make this work somehow. And, um, you know, I just, I just have to say that the people on my team, um, especially Jeanette Yu, who is um, my lighting designer and like video designer, but really just like an incredible artist and Gian, who's a set designer, they were just like, we were right there in the thick of it, figuring out how to make this happen. And, um, you know, we knew that the actors would be in two different spaces and we didn't want to, you know, there was nothing that we can do to make them look like they were in the same mm -hmm. location. So we, so I knew from the beginning that we weren't going to waste a lot of time trying to make it look like they were in the, in the same shared space, but um, we wanted to create um, an interesting and meaningful parallel space, you know, where and we were working with whatever spaces that the actors had. Um, and they, <laughs> it was just, it required so much um, effort and care from every, everybody. Um, and especially the actors because they had to be their own lighting designer, their own set designer, their own costume designer. They had to, you know, do all of this preparation before every shoot day and um just i'm just so full of gratitude towards them for making making it possible mm. the next question um what inspired the choice based approach and then how did you achieve it when you produced it originally yeah so i had the commission from the play company in 2010 to create uh, a play, whatever I wanted to. Um, and so as I was kind of meditating on what I wanted to write about, that was when the earthquake happened. And, um, you know, the earthquake, it just left an incredibly deep, just valley in, in my heart. I mean, I don't know what it was like for you, Yoko, but I, I didn't, I remember like I didn't sleep for, you know, maybe yeah. a month or two months. It was just like shattering in, in this deep psychic way. Um, and so as I was following the news day by day, I was also, people were drawing parallels to Chernobyl. So I was doing a lot of research into Chernobyl and in my research into Chernobyl, I there was some kind of weird um, confluence where people were making horror movies about Cher that were set in Chernobyl, or like a lot of video games that were set in Chernobyl. And at first, I was kind of repulsed by it. You know, I was like, "Why are you taking these like globally tragic events and making them a backdrop to?" A weird zombie game, yeah. you know? um, and so I was kind of trying to grapple with that question: like, what is it that we, you know, we have this desire to sensationalize things that are tragic? Um, and then I started wondering, kind of like, well, what would it mean to? use the mechanics of that game, uh, of a video game, um, but try to make it a more kind of psychologically or emotionally meaningful event. Um, because I also found that as the weeks and the months went by, there was less and less coverage about the earthquake in, in the American media. And whereas I felt like I couldn't 
it was not easy for me to move on. And so the play was made in, in, in a way for me to kind of invite the audience back into that point of crisis um, mm -hmm. and to see, kind of pose to the uh, audience, like how, how do you make, how would you make these decisions if you were there? Mm -hmm. And in terms of how we executed it in the theater, um, the whole play was in the round. So the, the audience, uh, the performers were in the center and the audience uh, sat all the way around them. And they were giving these paddles. It was very, um, <laughs> it was very analog um, because the whole scene was in Japanese as it is here, the, the subtitles were projected onto the walls and then the prompts were also projected onto the walls and the audience would uh, use their paddles to vote. Um, and we would just eyeball how many people voted for, for which selection. Okay, the next question. Um, how, many difference in, uh, how many different endings does the play have? Has the audience ever vote for her to save herself? Also, was there a reason why Maki looked at the audience in the, uh, uh, the Maki looked at the audience Oh, sorry, my it's kind of audience in the end. It was interesting to see that. Sorry, it's kind of like moving yeah. my. Um, <laughs> it's funny that everybody asks how many endings there are because for me, um, the way the endings land, uh, I feel are different depending on what journey you have taken to get there. Um, but the simple answer is that there, are, you know, at the end, there are actually, you always come to the same decision point, which is to save yourself or help your sister. And in the however many performances that we had in 2015, and how and these three virtual live stream performances that we've had, everybody has chosen to help your sister. Um, so we've never gotten to see what save yourself <laughs> looks like. Um, yeah. Well, actually, um, I just would like to mention that to the audience, um, from tomorrow, there will be a, a on-demand version will start. So if you are curious, I'm sure that you are curious how, how it goes if I choose not A and B. And you can try everything. So you will know how many versions that then it's available. And then also you will learn how much effort and the time that this artist team has spent for some scenes that it may not have been really seen much time and stuff like that. So I think that I, I really would like you to um, uh, try out some other ways. So another question. Um, well, another question, yes, yes, is here. Uh, what was the meaning of the Zoom squares? Oh, what was the, the meaning of the Zoom squares becoming more and more offset from the each other, not contagious in the first part? Did the uh, correspondent to the sisters become more out of the sink uh, with each other? Would that have looked different if different audience choices had uh, prevailed? Yeah, so yes, um, we were pushing more and more into, you know, at, at first we had Yuki, uh, I mean, Maki and Maho um set up in a way that you could understand there was the coffee table between them and it was important to establish that at the at the beginning to create the sense that okay even though they are obviously in different spaces we are in a shared imagined space but after we established that um, the movement of the the frames and the way they were composited together um, was really in reaction to what kind of um, psychological like meeting or balance the sisters were having with each other. Um, we actually shot that, you know, once we get into the conversation with the sisters and, you know, all of those choices, we actually shot that from shot both actors from two different angles. So we even were playing with maybe showing 
four squares, so two of each of the actors, um, but that started to get um, visually convoluted. So we, yeah, that was definitely a reflection of um, how they were in sync or out of sync with each other. And I just remembered the end of the last question was about um, the, uh... Maki, Maki looking into the camera. I mean, yes, that was, that didn't happen in the theater. Um, we did it for the camera specifically. Um, I mean, in many ways, the camera helped us to tell the story or helped us to connect with the audience in a very specific way, right? So mm -hmm. to have Yuki who has not, not looked into the camera during the whole scene, look into the camera deliberately, the intention was really to put the audience there in a place of responsibility or accountability to that character well this is actually my question but um, um you have never made the online theater production and so looking at the camera that is not happening in a theater version so how did you come up with that idea is that from the rehearsal or you already have a very specific visual image by the time that you start shooting um, well, that was a that was actually one of the first things that I knew about what I wanted to make because um, when we were when we were in the theater, uh, Saori, the actor who played um, the avatar Maho, she was tasked with trying to make as much eye contact with as many audience members in the theater as possible, which was it's actually quite difficult as you can imagine, um, and to have the entire audience body located in the camera actually made it very easy. It was, mm -hmm. uh, you know, to establish that kind of intimacy and immediacy. So that was one thing that I knew <laughs> from the beginning. There were a lot of other things that I didn't know I um, until we started. Well, this is a genuine question. Is there any chance once the pandemic is over that you will present the whole play live again? Oh my gosh. Um, well, that depends on you, Yoko. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I knew that you'd respond to that way. <laughs> I mean, this play has a very special place in my heart. Um, it, but uh, it's an incredibly um, difficult and sprawling um, play. The the first act. Actually, the backdrop that you see here, this is a photograph of a model set that my set designer, Gian, built. Uh, she actually created a whole model of uh, this apartment in uh, Chernobyl. Mm -hmm. um, and every single room was you know, furnished and decorated. And you could even see, look out the window of the model and see mm -hmm. um, the Ferris wheel and, and the environment outside. And uh, in the first act of the play, which is about a woman who had lived in Pripyat and had to evacuate during the 1986 accident, um, she discovers that through a video game set in Chernobyl, she's able to go to her childhood home that she has never been able to return to since mm -hmm. the evacuation. Um, and so it involved using these medical cameras going into the model, um, and so on and so forth. I'm actually, um, I actually really hate using technology in my plays because it makes me really nervous. There's so much out of my control, um, but this play happens to have um, a lot of it um, and in the very uh, competent hands of, mm. of Jeanette. <laughs> well, speaking of the live performance that then I don't know how many people from Japan people in Japan are watching this one. I know, <laughs> I know that I am really trying to promote it. And I believe I, I remember I um, helped you to connect you to the people in, I mean, the presenters in Japan. Um, I really hope that uh, So next question, um, did you, did you initially intend Maho's set to be entirely white and um, uh, austere, or was that choice born out of the necessity? 
It's an interesting question. Whichever, it works very well to uh, distinguish the sisters. Yeah, the actual, um, in, in the stage production set, um, everything was white. So there were objects that looked, you know, like the, the food, for example, there was a peach. It, it otherwise looked like a normal peach, except that it was white. The phone was white, the table was white. Um, so the idea of a kind of neutralized environment was already part of the vocabulary of the piece. It just so happened that Saori uh, had access to her basement space, which um, was quite similarly neutral. Um, so we were able to recreate that for her. And for Yuki, the older Maki's role, um, her environment was very colorful and rich and you know, had all these like intricate details. And we wanted to kind of keep that uh, distinction between the two environments. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, some of the audience might uh, recognize Peach. Peach, did I see Peach? So Peach was not appearing today, but then Peach will oh. appear <laughs> when you see a different version. And there are many uh, other white things that, that uh, she mentioned. So you will know more about what she was explaining. Um, so then another question. Um, in in creating writing it, in creating slash writing it, did you think of uh, branches as plot or character defining variations? I get that moment in playing games with similar mechanics, but I wonder how that affects the writing. Yeah, I mean, it was all about, I mean, the, 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 this part of the play is divided into three sections. And the first section is really about exploring the environment and trying to gather information and gather context for where your avatar is. Um, and so that is not so much about uh, character development, but it's more about um, educating the audience and giving the audience enough information to be able to make future decisions. The second part, which really begins with the opening of the refrigerator and all through the, the conversation after that, um, that is very much about um, negotiating this intimate interpersonal relationship. Um, and I feel like this is actually where, um, oh, how should I put it? Like there, there's a cultural, there, it's a kind of a cultural education at play because some of the choices um, as from the perspective of a game player, some of the choices might seem passive or not exciting. Um, because I think as American viewers, we are, uh, we have expectations about conflict or expectations about wanting to see something exciting, but actually this play kind of pushes against that idea or challenges that idea um, because it's really about how do you negotiate a relationship with someone that you care about, but someone who doesn't necessarily uh, shares your, who shares your ideas or sensibilities about things. How do you get someone to trust you? How do you get them to open up to you? Um, yeah, so, so character development, yes, but in perhaps a different way than might be conventionally used. See, well, I should have mentioned that that was the last question. I have uh, a cue from our manager that then I, this is uh, a time to wrap up. Um, before we say bye bye, I would like to have a two announcement. One is like actually today, March 11th, a We Japan site is exhibition opened today. So since we closed the building um, to the public almost a year, well, exact a year, and then we are very excited to have a new exhibition, which is about the Japanese traditional carpentry. So if you are interested in, I'm sure you are interested in, um, go to the website and then reserve your slots that um, um, you want to uh, visit. That is the uh, uh, CDC uh, guidelines that we are following. The other question, the other thing, um, it's about performing arts. We will have another program in the end of this month, March 30th, Shomyo Buddhist Chanting. 
And um, um, that was actually, that program was especially uh, video recorded in one of the oldest temples in Tokyo. So it's very beautiful and very serene. And I give you a very peaceful mind. And, um, um, and then also related the April 4th uh, live show me workshop to everyday wellness. I think that we really need those kind of things. And then all those one of the kind of programs are made available, made possible through your uh, each of your audience support to Japan Society. So visit www.japansociety.org slash donate and you can easily uh, give us money. So thank you so much for joining and I um, um, hope to see you very soon. And then thank you. And then applause one more to Aya. Thank you. All right, thank you. Bye-bye.